Well, welcome back, my friends, to the Bible study today. We finally get to the centerpiece of the book of Philippians. So, in Philippians chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 5, where Paul begins this beautiful essay on Christ, and it really sums up the gospel. It's a beautiful passage that describes Christ at echoes of Old Testament passages such as Genesis 3 and Isaiah 53 and New Testament gospel-rich passages such as Romans 5, and it ties it all together in the person of Christ. Now, this really is the pinnacle of the book of Philippians because Paul is writing to the Christians telling them that our life ought to replicate Christ. It ought to depict the gospel. And so this is where we get the description of Christ. So let's start in Philippians 2, verse 5. The Bible says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, this passage, it gives a miniature summary of the entire gospel story that plays out throughout the entire Bible. So the first thing we see is Jesus' incarnation. Right there in verse 6, it says, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, to be equal with God. Now, right here in verse 6, there's a contrast between our iniquity and Jesus' incarnation. And you say, what do you mean by that? Well, um, it's basically, uh, it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. And so it's replaying the narrative that happens in Genesis at the fall. And it's a contrast between Adam and Jesus. So if you think back, Adam chose to rebel in Genesis 3. Adam was told not to eat of the forbidden fruit, um, but Adam tried to make himself equal with God. And, you know, friends, whenever we choose something we want more than God, we are making ourselves God. Because if we want something more than God, and we're the person that chooses what that object is, then really we're choosing what we want. We're making ourselves God. And even if we want something from God more than we want God himself, we're missing the point. That is not the gospel. The gospel is not that Jesus saves you so that you can have a great life. The gospel is that Jesus saves you so that you can come to know God. So that God can forgive you from your sin. So there's this contrast between Adam's rebellion and where Adam tried to make himself equal with God. And then the the contrast is Jesus, who is God, and he did not exploit his deity for his own advantage. Jesus had every right to remain in heaven with God, but he chose not to. And that's the incarnation. Now, this isn't the false doctrine called canonic theology or kenosis, which is the idea that Jesus emptied himself of being God. No, Jesus didn't empty himself of his deity, but he emptied himself by becoming man. If you look back at the verse in verse 7, it says, But made himself of no reputation. In other words, he chose not to exploit his deity for his own advantage, but instead he took upon him the form of a servant. That's how he um, humbled himself, by taking on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. See, Jesus didn't empty himself of his deity. No, uh, Jesus, instead, he chose to be incarnate. That means in human flesh. The incarnation is not man being filled with God. That's very important. See, man being filled with God is what happens when uh, someone becomes a believer. At the point of salvation, you have a man who is filled with the Holy Spirit and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. That's not what the incarnation is. But it is God taking up human residence. Colossians 2.9 says about Christ, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
I'm just going to read a passage from Hebrews chapter 2. This is Hebrews 2, starting in verse 14, going all the way down to verse 18. I'm just going to flip over there. Because this, this gives a real clear explanation of what the incarnation is all about. So starting in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. See, in all things he was made like unto his brethren. Jesus was truly God in flesh, 100% God and 100% man. But not only do we see Jesus' incarnation in this passage, we also see Jesus' substitutionary atonement. So verses 7 and 8 say, But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. You see, this is the fact that Christ died in your place. I wish I could take the time to read all of Isaiah 53, but if you get a chance today, I know it's a Tuesday, (laughs) I'm sure it's busy, but if you get a chance, I hope you'll go over and read Isaiah 53 today. And it's a great, it's a beautiful explanation of Christ's substitutionary atonement. He died in our place. He took our sin. I'll just read two verses from Isaiah 53, verses 10 and 11, and they say, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. Stop and think about the life that Christ led. His ministry definitely had its highs and lows, but let's not forget This life you have been given is supposed to be a replica of Christ's life. Folks, Jesus died to pay the price for our sin. We owe him full surrender. So I wonder if we're we're doing that today. He died in our place. We owe him everything. And so let's go ahead and read the last couple verses, verses 9 through 11. And they say, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is Jesus' exaltation. And it's almost a direct quote from Isaiah 45, verse 23. Friends, the day is coming when God will put all his enemies under the feet of Christ, and we will see Christ face to face in that day. So I wonder if you're ready. I hope you are ready for that day. If if you're not, then Jesus calls you to repent of your sin and believe the gospel. And if you have trusted in Christ as your Savior, I hope you will live for him until he returns. It could be today. Hope you have a great rest of the day in the Lord. 